Welcome to Real Estate Conversations with Harsh, episode five. And today we have an interesting person with us. His name is Christian. He's the CIO of the Ali Ferris Group and is a thriving real estate investor uh, with holdings in multifamily residential and other commercial properties. And now today he's with us uh, because he now believes in giving back to the community by spreading his knowledge. Uh, just a little background on him. He has been in executive positions previously uh, in the private and public public sector uh, in technology companies. But then he refocused all attention towards investments in real estate and tech startups. So we'll now know more when we bring him on. Welcome, Christian. Good afternoon, Harsh. Good afternoon. So tell us a little bit more about your journey. You were in the public sector or the private sector working in executive positions. Now you moved on to like real estate investing and completely like full time. And now you're also venturing out in tech startups. So let us hear more about your journey. And then we'll also like to know, because you don't do JVs, that's the most important topic, right? You do it all uh, by yourself, which is which is really great. Uh, so we'll, we'll dive deep into that as well. I'll give you the uh, sort of uh, quick uh, overview in terms of uh, how I got to where I am at. I finished a degree in physics uh, in oh. university. That's kind of where I started and then somehow ended up in uh, in technology companies uh, doing, uh, you know, effectively software and, and technology engineering. Okay. Uh, the telecommun telecommunication and data networking space. So that was a good chunk of my career. I had a lot of opportunity to uh, to see uh, the growth of tech companies, uh, see a lot of startups, and and help uh, or get to see them grow, and then eventually became part of helping them out. Um, so I started investing in real estate around, uh, I mean, re in any serious way, probably about 2005. Um, right. and, uh, then we grew our portfolio from there. Uh, and then eventually left my, uh, my tech career in 2017 to, uh, to focus on, uh, on real estate investing on a full-time basis. And quite frankly, it was because the, uh, the portfolio had gotten so large, I, I simply couldn't do two jobs at the same time. And, you know, you're an ex-tech guy yourself, so you know how demanding technology can be. So you, yes. know, you, you can't have two loves on the go at the same time. You have to choose. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. No. And uh, especially working with IT companies, there are benefits too. There are there are good pay benefits and other kind of benefits. But honestly, I felt that they do suck the blood out of you when you're working and you, you don't know. Uh, you just get into that rut and you just continue working for 12 hours for so many years and you don't even realize it until that burnout happens. That's, that's absolutely right. I, I couldn't have said it better myself. I mean, I, I loved what I was doing in tech. Yes. You know, working 10 and 12 hour days uh, during the week was not something that I ever uh, found to be a hardship. But at the same time, I didn't know till I left that, that career and focused on my real estate business um, that uh, it was a gilded cage. Right. You're, yes. you know, it's comfortable, you're paid well, et cetera. Yes. And, um, but you're in a cage. Right. And yes. when I left, I suddenly realized that I was free now. Yes. And, um, and that's, uh, that's really lightning for the heart for sure. Yes. Yes. Always is. Okay. Now talk to us, like, uh, what kind of real estate investments? I know you do multi-units, like, is there a specific kind of asset that you do in multi-unit and other commercial side or it's just any commercial like seven and up any kind of uh, sizes because people have preferences like they only go up to 20 25 and then they stop or some people only start at 25 and up mm -hmm. i mean 25 units right yep. no I, I understand what you mean um yep. so i wouldn't say that i have a i guess i have a preference for uh residential multifamily, like the commercial level stuff um, but it's not the way I think about it. I think about uh, when an opportunity presents itself, whether or not there's a solid business case and I have pretty strict criteria in terms of uh, what I choose to buy, what I'm going to be doing with it and what my exit criteria are going to be. Yes. And, and as you know, uh, you know, depending on time or, you know, or specific 
you know eras in the economy one asset class maybe you know have better returns than another asset class so yes right now everybody seems to be jumping on the multifamily bandwagon and uh uh you know which, which is fine it, it is a solid asset class um yes. but it's not what i've always invested in so for example in 2017 when i needed to replace the income that I had from my day job, I was looking for assets that had strong cash flow. Yes. So uh, that's at the time that was more light industrial uh, building. So we put some energy early on for light industrial work and, and we also picked up some multifamilies at the time that had good cash flow. Um, and now light industrial uh, has come down, its cap rates have come down, therefore the cash flow on a purchase isn't necessarily very strong. Um, but when I was buying them, I was buying them for, you know, cap rates in the order of like 10, right? So 10% cap rate, 11%, you know, 9%, right. somewhere in that area. So the yielded strong cash flow, I mean, you have to keep them occupied. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. you know, otherwise they go negative real fast, but, uh, the, uh, but we kept them, we filled them up, uh, quickly. They were somewhat distressed at the time. Okay, uh, but uh, we filled them up quickly. They generated strong cash flow that gave us the foundations to build our investment business. Um, we restructured a lot of the existing portfolio at the time in order to optimize cash flow, and uh, which meant then that we had the the money required on a month to month basis to be able to pay the staff and and do the work that we needed to do at the at the time. So, you know, it started with, uh, you know, we bought uh, some smaller multifamilies like uh, four units and not, you know, six units and nine units and 10 units and stuff like that. At the time, we picked up light industrial uh, during the 2017, 2018 era. Then we started moving to mixed use uh, buildings. Okay. You'd have, say, retail on the main floor and you'd have residential up above. Uh, so we started picking those up uh, probably about 2019, and it's still a strong asset class for us. Um, yes. I like them because a lot of people are intimidated by them. And so people tend to look at them and say, oh, well, I understand multifamily, but I'm a little worried about commercial, pure commercial and dealing yes. with commercial leases and commercial tenants and commercial vacancy, which is great for me. It reduces the competition on purchase. And <laughs> yes. It, side effect, which is you tend to be able to buy them at a little bit higher cap rate, um, just on yeah. a collective basis, they tend to be a higher cap rate because of that unknown, but they, but then you have, if you buy them right and in the right configuration, you have all the same advantages as a multifamily building. Um, so you still get advantages with uh, CMHC uh, equity takeout, uh, as long as you meet the CMHC parameters. So that's that's still a you know main street mixed use commercial is something that I really find to be a good value these days still. Okay, and where are you currently investing? Hmm. So good question. Uh, we buy stuff in the downtown Ottawa core. Okay. Uh, some of the tier two towns just outside of Ottawa. So uh, we've been focusing in the past on Carleton Place. Uh, which is uh, just on Highway 7, just west of the city. Uh, yes. And we've bought recently with Almont, in Almont, uh, we started, we bought a portfolio there just over a year ago. Um, and that is a beautiful town. It's an amazing little area. Yes. Yeah. So, and the yeah. Carlton Place is the, the town that is next to Perth, I guess, right? Perth. Carlton Place, yeah. So Perth would be, so on the way, to Perth from Ottawa, you would go yes. to Carleton Place. Yes, yes. And okay. if you go to Smith Falls, where Canopy, the Canopy Growth Headquarters is, uh, you still have to go through Carleton Place. Yes. If you want to go to yeah. Almont, you'll go through Carleton Place. So Carleton Place, what I liked about it, what I saw in it at the beginning was the fact that it was a hub town. Yes. Um, it So it necessarily meant that a lot of commuters would have to go through there. A lot of business would consolidate around the hub town. Yes. When we bought at the time, um, it was highly undervalued. And I knew it would go up, but I didn't know when. Right. And as it turned out, it went up fast, like within a few years of us buying all kinds of buildings. Right? 
Yes, that is so great. Okay, now talk to us about your strategy. What I have witnessed and what many people, like 95% of the people do, because either they quickly run out of money or they don't have the money to start. These are the two factors. They just don't have the money to get into this. So they do JVs, they do shareholder agreements. Basically, raising capital is what they do. And they use other people's money, which uh, surprisingly, you do not. Uh, you built it on your own. You don't do JVs and you don't do anything of that sort. So talk to us a little bit about yourself as give us some insight. If somebody needs to do it, how do they do it? And like, do you take a lot of private money? Do you take a lot of debt on the property or how, how, how do you do this? All fantastic questions, actually. So I'm, I'm a simple person, right? Yes. So I, <laughs> I don't want a lot of extra complexity in my life. What we do now is already quite complex. Um, so we made decisions. My wife is my business partner and mm -hmm. uh, we made decisions early on that we wanted to stay in full control of what we were doing. So, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, well, Christian, you were an executive in the tech sector. Therefore, you had lots of money coming into this. And that, that's simply not true. As it turns out in anything, we tend to spend and run our lifestyle based on yes. the that we have. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. You never, you never know when that $20 shirt became the hundred dollar shirt, right? It just, it just happens. It, it, it just happens. And, and yeah. the other thing that, to, you know, that people probably don't realize is we were a single income family. So, uh, you know, uh, my wife and I decided to, that she would be raising the children. Um, it was mostly her decision to be fair. Right. But I supported that. Yes, uh, so we've been a single income family for a long time. And, uh, you know, the tax system certainly uh, dissuades people from being single income families for anybody listening that's a single income family, you know what I'm talking about. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> but so we didn't start with a ton of capital. I'll, I'll give you the equity journey, right? So you understand how we got to where we are. Um, we bought our first house, um, uh, you know, back in roughly 1990. So actually we bought a piece of land that we thought we were going to build a house on. And then we, as soon as we did it, we, uh, you know, decide, well, I guess we should own a house so we know what we want in the design. So we kept the land, we bought a house. That house at the time we bought with um, the assumption of one salary. So we've always lived only on one salary. Uh, yep. with mine. And uh, everything my wife earned at the time, we would put right into principal repayment. So we were building equity uh, yes. very quickly at the time. Then when we, uh, we then bought another house. So that house was an inexpensive house way out in the country, right? We were just focused mm -hmm. on building our equity at the time. Yes. Then once we largely paid off that house, we then bought another house closer into the city in the suburbs. And then we did okay. the same thing there, right? It was just, we used one salary to pay it down. And then at that point we had children. So that's when my wife quit her job to, to raise our children. Yep. And then at that time, we then moved into right into downtown Ottawa, right? Using again, the equity from the previous house in order to buy the third house. And in that, uh, that journey all the way through the mortgage we had was always about the same size as the original mortgage that we had when we had that little house way out in the country. Yes. Um, so that's how it became. Uh, you know, maintainable all the way through. But what we were building was a little bit of equity there. Now, yes. I will tell you that buying a house is really more of a inflation hedged savings plan. Yes. Like, does not grow your equity. So th that's how we built our original nest egg, but it was not what I would say the most efficient path. And we didn't really know any better. We were just doing what we needed to do. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So you were just uh, cashing out the equity when it was built to a certain amount, and then you refi, take out that money and use it someplace else, right? That's what most people do. Okay. That's right. Right. But, yes. it, but I think one of the things that's a bit different, a lot of people seem to have an expectation that they need to immediately buy downtown or immediately buy in the suburbs. We bought what we could afford on a single yes. at the time. Yes. And that meant that our mortgage payments were much smaller, which meant you could pay it faster. And so, yes burdened by the cost of non-tax deductible interest, which is what you end up with a single, with your own yes. primary home. Um, so at that point, uh, you know, we had some equity in our home and that's when we bought our first property back in 2005. We ended up selling the land, by the way, we made some money in the land. It was, it, you know, it was land banked. It didn't make great money for us, especially after all the carrying costs of property taxes, everything we made a little bit, Yeah, but it was, uh, 
uh, really our first investment property was a pure leverage property. We put 25% down. It was a four unit building. Um, and uh, then that's when we really started to think about forced appreciation. Yes. Uh, so that so we had our house, we had the four unit building. I waited uh, probably about another four or five years for enough equity to build up before we then bought our next property. So again, it was slow because I wasn't as clever as I am now, right? So you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but you learn, right? You learn yes. as you go, right? And yes. And so one of the benefits that we have these days is there's good education programs and good coaching that uh, absolutely will allow people to accelerate faster than what I originally did. So I took this slow and steady approach, but then we started to really pick up in about 2010 uh, when we bought a sixplex and we converted it to a nineplex. Oh, wow. And we did that because we inherently saw that uh, it was being underutilized and we could do some very simple things to create the nine unit building. In fact, the soft costs, the development charges were probably more expensive than the actual construction work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but but that was an epiphany for me. Right? Okay. I really understood the concept that, especially with a commercial building, where the yes. value is driven on the net operating income, yeah. that if I can increase the net operating income, I increase the value of the building. And as soon yeah. as you do that, you generate new working capital that comes out. So yep. you cover more than just the money you put in. You create it new value and you take more money out. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. And yes. once, once I understood that, right, well, then we just went on a tear. <laughs> yes. No. And and then also it gave you time because uh, by like 12, it gave you five to seven years when you first started to build up that equity and then uh, cash it out and then use it uh, on these places to buy. Right. And once that circle comes to a full circle, then it just repeats after some time. Like you just do that circle one, 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 and then then it becomes two circles and then three circles, right? Depending on the number of properties you're doing a refi on. Well, I, I would suggest to you that it's not, uh, you know, again, to use an engineer's term, it's not a linear thing. It's it's actually a an exponential function. Okay? Yes, and, and, yes. And, and I know you know what I mean by that, but some of our listeners are, are probably not quite as math inclined. <laughs> what I mean by that in very simplest terms is my house became a house plus a rental property. Yes. And my house and a rental property you know, effectively, it you kind of think of it as doubling. So each yes. of us builds up equity. So now you have yes. four, and then a four yes. builds equity, and that becomes eight, and eight, yes. 16, et cetera. So your the equity growth happens faster than most people would realize. It's not sequential. It, things start yes. happening in parallel. Yep. And, and so time helps build your equity, you know, very efficiently. And, and the fact that we're doing a forced appreciation, like if you don't do forced appreciation, you just buy an asset and you hold it, it's, yes. it still happens, but the timeline is much slower, right? But if you do a forced appreciation strategy, increase the value of the building, um, you make that timeline faster, right? Yes. So. Yes. No, that's, that's what it is. And so you started like almost 20 years now, right? Almost like 18 years, 18 plus years that you started. So. You started with one, and now you are at how many units, doors, buildings? Yeah, quite quite a few. We we don't we don't talk about actual numbers. So <laughs> okay, okay. So in terms of portfolio, would you like to share what your portfolio size is? No, I don't. I don't share that okay. information. But uh, the um, uh, let me put it to you this way: we we run a business. We run, uh, you know, we have staff, right? Yes. And it's all driven off the cash flow of the portfolio. Yes. I mean, you know, the the reason I don't answer that question is really very simple. Uh, one is that uh, my net worth is my net worth, and it's I don't divulge that, right? And yes. Provide that information from this. The other is I don't want to set expectations with people about volume of doors because I know people with tens of thousands of doors that make about five cents on the door on average, right? And yeah. you know, people who have, I don't know, like call it 50 doors that are making four or $500 a door on average. Wow. Right? Yes. And you know what? I'd rather be the guy that has the 50 doors. Yes. So, yeah. so that's why I just want to make sure that the listeners are, are thinking about, it's not about how you collect 
It's very yes. much about how your assets perform. Perform, yes. And how much you are able to extract out of, as a cash from them. That's right. Cash flow and, and working capital. Yes. That, that's what you need to focus on as the primary mantra. The rest, the growth will take care of itself. Yep. Okay. That is that is just so wonderful. Okay. So now coming to the market now, where uh, like you have been in this for 20 years, you have been through cycles, you've been through the 20, 2008 uh, depression time as well. Now we are kind of in a very... Like today, uh, now we feel that July 12th is coming, right? In five days next week, next Wednesday. And uh, there's like, as per me, the data points that I study, they are going to, again, jump it up, bump it up by like about 0.25. I'm just afraid they might do 0.5 as well, but uh, I'm just a little positive. Where do you see uh, the market going and uh, how do you analyze the market, like in considering the current times and also, uh, introspecting where like in 2008, nine, because you have been in times where the interest rates were like 15, 13, 14% on the regular mortgages, right? Regardless of what the interest rates were. So no, never that high, Th those really high interest rate pairs were probably early eighties. And, okay. uh, you know, as, as experienced as I am, I was still in high school in the early eighties. So my parents oh, okay. threw through that a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but normally like six to seven percent, you have seen that oh, yeah. uh, on a normal, right? Yep. Yeah, and, and and that's right. I, I mean, the way to kind of think about it is, you know, over the last three or four decades, interest rates have been coming down since yes. the eighties. But uh, and that's why, in general, variable rates have made sense for people because over the long term, it was always trending in that direction. But what people don't really appreciate, and you call that the two thousand eight uh, time frame, since about just past 2008, we've been in an unusually low interest rate period. Yes. So, you know, the I remember talking to my banker even back in uh, like 2011, 2012, and and uh, just you know bewildered by the fact that I was having interest rates on my commercial mortgages that were sub two percent. And uh, you know, I jokingly refer to as these bizarre, unusual interest rates. And yes. Uh, and I remember that vividly uh, because we then had the same thing happen for another 10 years. So, so there's another, there's a whole generation of people that have come into the real estate market thinking that having a one or 2%, you know, interest rate is perfectly normal. And the yes. question is, are we going to return to that? And that isn't the right way to think about it. So the interest rates were low because the government of Canada, or more specifically the Bank of Canada, was trying to stimulate the economy because we were having kind of faltering steps all the way through, uh, you know, whether there were minor recessions, major, minor recessions, major recessions, et cetera. But there was always concern about the economy. And every time they tried to raise the, the interest rates a little bit, the economy would, you know, stutter and then they would back <laughs> off a little bit. Um, so the Bank of Canada has been dying to get mm -hmm. interest rates back to something that they feel is normal. Uh, for, you know, aside from the inflationary pressures, they're in the back of their minds, I'm convinced that they're thinking, we need to keep, you know, reestablish the new baseline of what the interest rates are going to be, so that if we have a real recession, there's something to back off and have some room for stimulus. Yes. So, so I think that's something in the back of their minds. Um, and then, of course, inflation has popped up. And I like the way Benjamin Tall said it. He said, the Bank of Canada um, hates of inflation more than it hates a recession. So, so err wow. on the side of raising interest rates to fight inflation, if there's even a little bit of risk of inflation, even if it means that they may cause a recession in the process, yes. runaway inflation is just far form more dangerous in the long run. And yes. I would agree with that. So No, I agree. I agree too. And uh, yes, the inflation needs to be controlled because otherwise, uh, interest rates are like temporary, right? Uh, they can come down once the inflation is balanced and as per what uh, the Bank of Canada wants it to, that is under 2%, which really benefits the economy in like the next decade or more to come, right? But if we think about that for a second, right? So, okay, so Bank of Canada achieves their target of, of reaching the 2 to 2.5% two range that uh, yes. they're always talking about. And so they achieve that. Okay, so what's their motivation to bring interest rates down, 
right? So if the if the economy doesn't stall and yes. it's perfectly fine and, and moving along, uh, you know, at current interest rates, they're going to want to stay there. They're, they're not going to want to stimulate the economy otherwise they'll just, you know, initiate inflation again. So if the economy looks like it's it's faltering a little bit, they may trim it down, right? Yes. Bring it down, you know, a quarter point to a half point. Um, you know, and if the if we really go into a deep recession, they'll bring it down, but they're only going to bring it down as much as they need to in order to uh, minimize the impact of a recession and avoid a you know a, a full on depression. Yep. So, so that that's kind of the way you need to be thinking, or you know, not you specifically, but but people listening need to be thinking about it. If you're in the governor of Bank of Canada's shoes. Yes. Like, what do you, you know, and this is the only thing you have. You don't have brakes. You just have an accelerator pedal, which you can either put so, the gas down or, or, or you know, so. Yes. No, I, I, and I completely agree. Like, I don't uh, foresee the rates myself coming to that 1%. Like, HD, uh, HSBC, they were offering like 0.9%. Uh, rate of interest on the mortgages. I don't foresee that coming to that level again. Like I, I do see like it. It may hover around three, four, maybe even five percent, which will put some breaks. But again, it depends on Bank of Canada's inflation policy, right? If they feel that something is breaking up, they might say, "Okay, we'll give you a little bit down," and then it stimulates it. But yeah, if it, uh, uh, if they start like in twenty twenty five, if they start coming down like. In a year, they come down to back to one percent. We'll end up in the same situation we were like in twenty twenty one. Well, and there's other things that are you know driving some instability in the in the money markets, right? One is liquidity, right? Yes. Within financial institutions um, and the counterparty risk between these different financial institutions. So, uh, you know, effectively, a counterparty risk is where uh, you know the banks are kind of loaning money between each other right mm -hmm. Which, you know offset by certain assets but it yes. necessarily means that if one bank is struggling it has a potential for domino effect with other banks yes canadian banks are really well regulated so we're not as exposed as we would be if we were in the us or in europe but there's still some amount of county party risk and it does affect the bond market Right, which yep. is where the mortgages, the the fixed mortgages, yes. are based on the bond market versus the you know overnight. Absolutely, rate. yes. So, so there's that. There's energy costs. Part of that is obviously you know uh, the war with Russia and Ukraine, which is causing an elevation of of, of energy and oil. Yes. Yes. And natural gas, uh, yep. which is driving a level of inflation uh, in itself, because energy is a necessary input to everything we buy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Including food. So yes. when Russia invaded Ukraine, you know, the obvious thing is, you know, Belarus, which is part of the whole Russian piece there, um, is about 40% of the potash supply, potash being a key fertilizer. Canada's another 40%. Yep. So there was definitely a shortage of energy and fertilizer, which is causing, you know, part of the root cause. Food. All of that stuff says that there's an elevated risk of continued inflation there therefore there's a, a continued risk of sustained interest rates but i yes. will be the first person to tell you that uh, any prediction on the future with respect to interest rates i might be slightly above um you know random chance okay, okay. I might be slightly better than random chance and i think in in the big scheme of things for people to want to try and predict where interest rates are going and and betting the farm on that, you know, prediction is a very risky proposition. So the way I actually look at it is I look at it on a risk management basis. Mm -hmm. and I think, okay, right now we're in a in an uncertain environment. The yes. probability of inflation staying high, that interest rates will stay high, is high enough that I have to pay attention to it. And I have yes. to do something. So what, so what I do with a risk management plan is very simple, right? I identify the risk. I figure mm -hmm. out what would be the impact if that was to happen, okay? Yes. So if interest rates stay high, the impact would be significant negative cash flow impact on yes. the portfolio. And then I think about the probability of it happening. Well, the yep. probability of interest rates and inflation staying elevated is, I'd say, about, you know, in the 50% range. Yes, it's not necessarily going to happen, but it's something to be worried about. 
Okay, and I am I am worried about it. The severity would be significant on my portfolio. Therefore, I need to have a contingency plan to mitigate that risk and ensure that I'm not a victim of interest rate changes. Yes. So, so what I did through you know to mitigate that risk, just to give you an idea of how I managed it in my portfolio, I started, uh, especially when I was getting concerned about bank liquidity issues, because the bank liquidity issue necessarily means that getting new originated loans. It's yeah. going to be harder. Yes. And I knew when I was trying to renew a mortgage, actually, I was trying to do an equity takeout on, on one of the first loans coming to the CIBC. And they said, so we'll renew the loan, but we're not doing any equity takeouts. And this was at the same time that I had some concerns about bank liquidity. So I said, you know what? I don't know what the reason is. It could be asset reallocation. It could be, you know, that they were concerned. It, I don't know, but it, it immediately said, I need to protect our portfolio. So what I did yes. is I immediately refinanced everything in sight. And then what I did was I focused, uh, I took a different process in terms of getting preferential uh, interest rates and better terms. And I timed it as I needed it. And I ended up uh, refinancing a bunch of stuff between December and March of this okay. year. So why did I do that? Uh, one was, you know, I was less concerned about what I was going to end up paying in interest rates. But as it turns out, I got uh, what I think are really good rates, even on a historical basis. I was very keen on making sure I had lots of working capital on hand. Yes. And having lots of money on hand means that if if things go really weird in the economy, interest rates start going through the roof, or if uh, you know uh, recession happens and people can't pay and your revenue starts to dive, if your construction projects aren't uh, going the way that you think, or you can't take the equity takeout that you were planning on because interest rates are too high in the equity takeout side, I have money to deal with all of that stuff. And I yes. want to flush with cash to make sure that that was the case. So absolutely, and, that, and that's where we sit today. Absolutely, where we sit, and uh, possibly for the coming few more months, or I would say a couple of years, maybe. I don't, I don't see interest rates coming down like people were speculating that they might start coming down in twenty twenty four. I don't see it coming down until like twenty twenty five or uh, sooner than that. The simple answer is we don't know, right? Yeah. I think your your guess is reasonable in the sense that what you said was it's not likely to come down before that time frame but there's no guarantee it'll even come down after that yeah right? uh, and yeah we, we we because what i see is now people are like the deals i'm talking about right the deals that are coming in the market right now they're coming with mortgage assumptions the mortgage assumption is happening like it's the tenure is only the term is ending in 2026 or 2027 right or 2025 People are excited about those deals because they're right now seeing that 1.5 or 1.9 rate that is they're getting. But what what I see, uh, especially with the new investors, is they're not evaluating the property at that 2025 or 2026 market, right? They're not considering the fact that the cap rates uh, might go up the and the interest rates might remain the same at that time. So the evaluation of the property what they're having today might not be what they're projecting. That conservation should be there in the numbers uh, rather than, oh, we have this and in five years we'll be there. But I don't see that value in five years from now where like people, some people are projecting those values. And you've, you've hit it on a really good point there, Harsh, which is that when we take on new debt, Right, yes. Property, especially where we're leveraging a property higher, uh, you know, like at say 75, 80, or even 85% loan to value. What we need to think about over that term of the loan, and to get to, you know, what you're really saying here is that you have to find a way to deleverage that property by the time your your mortgage is due to renew. Yes. It could be forced into a situation where you're subject to new underwriting rules and yes. interest rates. And if you don't have a way to, like, if you haven't deleveraged the property, which could be you increase its value yes. right, or you reduce your debt, right? Yes. Like move on the side of increasing the value and 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 not paying down principal. But but that's because I'm disciplined in growing the revenue yes. portfolio. But the key, you know, as you're saying, is you have to have an exit plan 
for that. Yep. So in times of uncertainty, like right now, um, what I did was I got good, good interest rates on on uh, my you know mixed use and multifamily properties at CMHC underwriting. Believe it or not, I got interest rates in the three point eight five percent range, and I locked them in for ten years. Oh, uh, did you go for the MLI Select or no? On those ones, they were just straight uh, CMHC conventional. Uh, okay, but we underwrote them very aggressively, and then I waited for the bond market to uh, be in our favor. And as soon yeah. as I saw the yield rates come into a range that I wanted, and I could see that there was risk of it going back, I immediately pulled the trigger, did my uh, rate locks, and uh, and we closed within. Day days of, uh, of that so yeah that's 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 how like that's what is time in the market right that's where the experience comes in and that's a very good thought and like you said also on the exit strategy right people are not thinking about the exit strategy when the term will be over they're just thinking of an exit oh we'll think about it in five to seven years no but you have to renew the mortgage in between and that's what's going to eat up everything uh if it's not done conservatively or if you're not projecting it right it's a guiding principle that we have within our portfolio right and i think something that people need to think about a lot of people think about their loan to value on a particular asset yes yes and they think that the best thing to do is to have as much leverage as possible and they'll figure it out later okay um <laughs> The way I look at it, I run a slightly more conservative operation. So across our into any one deal that I have mm -hmm. might be very high leverage at the beginning because yes. you know, maybe I'm taking a project and I've got a business case where I'm going to double the value of the building over, I don't know, three years, two years, five years, whatever it happens to be. Fine. I'll take, take that on. But my portfolio has I never go above 65% debt to asset ratio. So oh, okay. of course have a lot of equity sitting in there. Now, some people would suggest to you that it's more efficient to do it at 75%. Um, you know, yeah. that's probably the optimal, but you know what? Uh anything can happen. Uh, you know, if we recall the uh the Quebec referendum, which affected Montreal real estate prices, even people that had relatively low debt to asset ratios get caught up in that tornado that happened after that, after that all happened. Um but the key is to make sure that at least in the portfolio you have equity to tap into in other places yes uh, my debt to asset ratio is at the moment relatively low um but uh it's um you know probably closer to 45 or 50 percent but i'm going oh, wow. to 65 percent and that that's the ballast that i have on the portfolio that is that is so great well my my uh for my portfolio i was like 70 percent uh the debt to ratio but 65 is even better and now you're saying that you're around 50 percent or lower which is like you're in a very good good situation which if the times even get worse than they are today you are pretty much uh balanced out and uh, that'll not really impact you as much as people who have like 75 to 80 percent leveraged i mean that's certainly true like i find that my my debt to asset ratio is too low okay because you yes. don't this is a leverage business. So in order for yes. you to make the good returns, you do have to take on some debt. So I do need to apply it, but I'm being a bit conservative at this period of time because yes. of all of the economic uncertainty out there. And quite frankly, if things go really bad, I've got all kinds of working capital that I can go and start buying stuff while everything is distressed. Yes, absolutely. And that's where that's where uh, I was going to. So coming back to the 2008-9 time, right? What what is the difference that you see? What was there at that particular time? And considering the real estate side, to now because now we are in a different situation than we were in two thousand eight nine, right? Mm -hmm. Two thousand eight nine was like a recession completely. Now we are headed towards a recession. We are almost like yeah, we are there, but we are actually not there yet. Yeah. So wh why do you think we'll have a recession? Because uh, if they continue to keep on like the increasing the rates, they are pushing us towards recession, right? Or maybe recession is not the right word because what I've seen right now is like businesses, there are too many businesses that are filing for bankruptcies. Uh, there are job losses in the market that are now coming or surfacing in the market. So that's, that's what my belief is. And plus the bond yields are going up, the interest rates are going up. They just increased like fixed rates by 100 VPS, right? 100 points. All of that combined uh, job losses and everything. Yeah. 
uh, it seems like we are headed towards a recession, but we are not there in a recession yet. Right. So as I take a look at the numbers, and we don't have the June numbers, employment numbers yet, I don't. Yep. So the what we've seen generally is a relatively robust labor market. Uh, yes. It, you know, you're right in certain sectors. So if we focus on, say, the tech sector, there was some layoffs, but a lot of that was, I think, trimming uh, the excess hiring that was happening during the pandemic. When we take a look at the labor market, it's been, you know, and, and subject to July, you know, the June June numbers, which we should hear about any day now. Um, it um, it looked like it was fairly robust from that side of it, and. When we take a look at the bond market, the bond market is really the bond market's interpretation of the future. Um, yes. As, you know, so interestingly enough, when the bond yields are, are effectively going up, it yep. implies that they think that inflation may be sustained, right? Is really kind of, they think that interest rates are going to stay elevated. So that's why the long-term rates tend to go that way. Yes. Still then, like if we looked even six months ago and you looked at the five and the 10-year bond yields, they were relatively low. And that yes. was really because the bond market felt that inflation was going to be solved within the five to 10-year time frame, that we could be heading towards a recession, as you're saying. So the simple answer is we don't know. Okay? Yeah, we don't know what we don't know, but... <laughs> <laughs> and these are these are just guesses, right? Coming out uh, from because people might follow different data points. What what I see, it's just an opinion that I'm uh, I what I am formulating for myself, right? No, a a absolutely. So you know, and they said before, right? My ability to predict the future is only slightly better than random chance. Okay, yes. just because I have slightly more intuition, maybe than random probability would have. <laughs> yes. Yes. And that's like, so you see that the interest rates will continue to hold for a longer time, like higher interest rates. Well, maybe not, not at these levels, but maybe a little lower, but yeah, higher than what they were. I see that the overnight rate and yes. variable rates are probably going to stay elevated. There's a, let me put it, there's a high risk that they're going to be elevated for a while. Yes. They come down, they're going to come down a little bit. Right, maybe you know, quarter point, half point, maybe even a full point, depending what the yes. Doing. But the Bank of Canada, I believe, is actually going to resist bringing it down unless they really are worried about uh, you know a recession. You know, the other thing we have to remember too is we brought in uh, 1.1 million people into this country last year, which is mm -hmm. unprecedented by yes. most double. And and immigrants, they go to work. Yep. <laughs> like they don't. You yes, know, they're they're part of the GDP production, right? Yes, so, um, you know, and that's one of the reasons that we we you know that Canada is very pro immigration is where birth rate is 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 too low. If we didn't have immigration, our economy would completely stall. Well, yes. the reality is we're increasing our quotas. We're bringing a lot more immigrants into this country, which makes it a better place to to live. It keeps our economy strong. But there's a side effect, right? They're contributing to the GDP and they're probably going to help reduce the risk of a recession as well. Yep. But, so, you know, we talked about energy, we talked about wars, we talked about immigration, we talked about, you know, all these various things that can have influence. And that's why I'm saying it's very difficult to predict how it's actually going to play out. Yeah. So what we really need to do as investors is we need to think about how do we protect ourselves against the unknown? Yes. Make bullish assumptions about, oh, well, the interest rates are definitely going to come down. Okay, well, it's fair. Let's assume that it would. How would that affect things? But what if it doesn't? How yes. would it affect it? What if interest rates actually continue to go up because <laughs> the economy bounces back and inflation is strong? And, you know, what are you going to do? Right? Yes. If you're betting the farm on interest rates coming down and you make that wrong decision. Are, are you, is that going to be a tragedy for you? Well, protect yourself. Absolutely. So that's really what I'm getting at. <laughs> yes. Uh, and and you're absolutely right. And I, I have a similar uh, opinion as well. And I agree that the interest rates might not come down for a long, long time. Like people were expecting they'll come down in 2024. I don't see them coming down 2024. But you know what? Anyway. So, so if you plan for it not, and yes. It does yes? It does come down, right? Well, yes. Boom, right? Like suddenly, yes. we're in really good shape. Right? Oh yeah. And then, then everybody will be in a pretty good shape. So now, uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, comparatively, the the residential multi-unit, only the residential side, compared to the commercial 
like the mixed use one that you do how different it is uh do the landlord tenant board law applies on the the mixed use part the commercial side as well or the uh like are there any differences in owning those buildings no, they're they're quite different um so uh you know a lease is a lease right at yes. the end of the line but it's governed by laws and for the yes. residential uh side of things certainly in ontario and most provinces have a separation between residential tenancies laws and commercial tenancies laws. Yep. Um, so I'll speak to Ontario because I know it much better than any of the other regions. Um, the Residential uh, Tenancies Act is the governing guideline around all things residential. Yes. Uh, that governs include everything, including what happens at the end of a lease, which is it goes month to month, right? Yep. The right of, uh, of retaining your tenancy takes priority over anything else, really. Yes. Um, so there's a very limited number of circumstances where a landlord could evict a tenant, right, uh, for, uh, without cause, shall we say. Yes. Um, you know, on the commercial tenancy side of it, it is the, the Commercial Tenancies Act is relatively thin in comparison. There's, there's, yes. um, there's just about fair practices is really what it, it talks about. And uh, when a lease, you, you can construct a lease just about in any way that you want. And when a lease comes to an end, it's basically governed by what's in the lease. So if the lease is completely silent about what happens at the end of a lease, the lease is done, right? And yes. the tenant has no rights to that unit. Yep. So in those leases, we usually, and you probably have this in your practice, but you usually build in things like whether or not they have renewal options and yes. their, you know, how you're going to decide on rents, uh, you yep. know, for future renewals. You might have a limited number of renewals. You might have, an, you know, any number of things. You might decide that the rent is going to increase at a prescribed rate every year, or you might decide it's fixed. It's completely wide open in terms of what you want to do. Yes. Another key difference is with residential leases, we usually end up constructing them in some form of what's called a gross lease. And what a gross lease is, is that it's, you know, pretty close to the definition of all inclusive. Okay. Yes. So, uh, you know, the landlord is paying the property taxes, the building insurance, maybe some of the utilities, and they might be offloading one or two of the utilities to the tenant, yep. uh, especially in a multi-unit building. Uh, with commercial, the default is what's called a triple net lease, right? Yes. So net of property tax, net of insurance, net of utilities. Yes. And uh, so typically what's done is the commercial tenant pays a portion of the property tax. That's, you know, either property tax is directly attributable to your unit or some pro rata based on square footage. Same with the insurance, same with the utilities. Yes. So the nice thing about that is when you build in a base rent uh, within a commercial, you are not at a victim of all of the other things that are happening around you, such as property tax increases, utilities. Yes insurance increases which have been insurance as you know has been nuts over the last four years oh yes so the yes. tenants end up picking up that cost and it, it's actually a lower risk for the landlord yes the the difference in terms of vacancy rates is because we're so short of housing in this country and have been yes. for a long time rental vacancy rates have been low since about 1975. oh wow it, it used to be at about six percent before 1972, and then there were changes to the, uh, the Income Tax Act, it was called the Tax Reform Act that happened in 1972. By 1975, we'd also introduced rent control, and the vacancy rate went from 6% down to floating just below 2% almost continuously since then. Wow. And so because of that, residential tenancies tend to be very stable, have a relatively low vacancy rate. When yes. the economy gets weird, People can't afford to buy houses, they have to rent. So even in a recession situation, yes. residential rent, you know, tenancies are, are a good uh, place to be. Commercial yes. tenancies have the opposite, right? So when the yep. economy is weak, right, people aren't spending money. So com you know, commercial entities uh, will struggle a bit more. And often with commercial, um, there's a lot of build to suit. So when a business needs new commercial space, such as in light industrial or just generally industrial property, they'll often say, we need a new warehouse of uh, 100,000 square feet. So what they'll do is they'll get someone to build it and they'll occupy it, right? Yep. So much more dynamic. 
So as a result, vacancy rates tend to be a little higher in commercial. Yes. Uh, depending where we are in an industrial park, we might uh, model a 10% vacancy rate, whereas residential might be at a 2% vacancy rate, yes. uh, including the bad debt component. So just talking pure vacancy. Uh, you know, if I'm looking at my main street retail, I might be a bit more aggressive and call it a 5% vacancy rate uh, because mm -hmm. main streets tend to, like when things get tough, right? The last commercial places to empty are the main street retailers, right? Yes. Like two or three blocks back from that, those will empty first. Yes. So, so th those are some of the key differences. Um, wow. If there's an eviction to happen on a residential side, it can take a long time, as you know. Yeah, well. years, <laughs> sometimes more than in <laughs> with a commercial tenancy, you put a notice on the door and change the locks. It's all done. Yes, and that's that's what uh, that's what the beauty of commercial is. And yeah, that that was a powerful insight, like uh, about the main street ones, because the tenants which are like some blocks away are not on the main street will empty the uh, faster and the main street ones will be the last ones to go that's another way to look at a property if it's on main street so yeah you know that the commercial part will hold value that's right and that's why you know almost all of my commercial lease space are on main streets in towns now that's that's a good insight yeah yeah and probably i can take a look uh on these kind of buildings too because and what 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 kind of uh commercial tenants do you look for like or let's say there is a building and there are xyz tenants already in place and the building is doing good what would make your decision and only on the terms of commercial tenants right that okay if this is one of the tenants gonna buy it or these are kind of the tenants that i don't want to deal with like some i've seen some people that they don't want food related uh like shops in their buildings or they don't want uh, some particular X, Y, Z, anything, it can be anything. Do you focus on any of those or do you love the restaurant kind of things or? Yeah, well, the, so there's kind of two parts to this. So the question is, if I'm buying, what am I looking for? So yes. if I see tenants in their commercial tenants that are what I would call not particularly recession proof or easily exposed or have a risk of high turnovers, that's why you were saying restaurants, restaurants notoriously come and go, right? Yes. So what I look at there is, and the lenders will look at it the same way, is what's the risk of those tenancies ending prematurely? I will take that into account and I will derate the value of a building on purchase based on the nature of the tenancy. So one is if they've got five-year leases in place or 10-year leases, that's one thing. And if they're good quality tenants, you know what? I'll probably see five to 10 years worth of, of uh, income from this. Yes. They're more challenging tenants. And I bought buildings with challenging tenants. Um, the You re recognize there's a risk, right? And you can mm -hmm. do one or two things there or both really. Yep. One is you can derate the value of the building based on what you predict the vacancy rate should actually be based on the current profile and your ability to fill it up with replacements. The other is that if you have, I bought a building that was actually very challenging. And uh, what I did was I was optimistic I could do well with it if I reconfigured the building. Yes. Um, but what I did is negotiated with the seller to um, to guarantee the rents for a two year period, right? So oh, uh, yes. vacancy, including the existing vacant units. And then if anything came vacant for the first two years of the property, they would guarantee the rents, right? So it wow. didn't the purchase significantly until I had a chance to do what I needed to do to reconfigure the property, attract new and better quality tenants and ensure that there was stability there. See, uh, guys, I hope viewers, this was this was a key important point that you would take a note of, right? Having, uh, when you're reconfiguring the building, that's that's what you always look for and guaranteeing those rents uh, from the seller is another key point that you can negotiate on when you are buying new buildings. That's that's a key. That's a very valuable input. Thank you, Christian. So asking you again, like coming back, would you buy if there is restaurants? Like you like buying restaurant with restaurants? Like people wouldn't need it. Uh, will eat food anyways, right? They yes. are kind of like recession proofs, right? Well, th that's right. So, um, yes. you know, so I want. I guess what you're really asking me is to answer the the other part of your question, right? Which yes. Is, so the first part is what, how you evaluate it on purchase. The other, Absolutely. what kind of tenants are you looking for as yes. you replace them? And uh, you know what you're hinting at there is your what we're really looking for are tenants that are relatively recession proof. Yes. So 
I think that is a key criteria. So for example, uh, we've got a new tenant who's doing their fit ups right now. It's mm -hmm. a barber shop, right? Uh, and yes. On the main street, there's a lack of barbers. There's a hairdresser on that main street, but there's no barber. And the town needs a barber, right? They have barbers, but they're like blocks away, not on the main street. So yeah. you know what? Everybody needs their hair cut, right? Yep. Even if they don't have a lot of money left, nobody likes to look shaggy, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> need to get their haircut so I'm looking at that thinking, <laughs> i have no problem with a long-term lease with this person because i know yes. their business uh you know short of the principles uh having other issues that business is going to do well so i do look for that but the other thing i look for is um and you may not be surprised and those of you uh, those of the listeners that that know me uh will will understand this is i don't just look at it financially i think about how i'm contributing to the social good so wow. my properties on the main street, I want to make sure that what I'm doing is I'm putting retailers in there that enhance the main street experience. It improves the town. It improves things like uh, tourism. It improves overall quality of life for the people that live there. It improves pride in their community, including my pride in the community. Um, and there's a secondary effect if I think about it, you know, maybe a bit more, um, uh, you know, selfishly, if you will, is that if I cr help create a good environment for the main street, it helps promote business for the main street as well. Yes. Everybody gets the benefit. Yes. It's an excellent way, actually. Not just good, <laughs> an excellent way. Wow. That is, that is, there are some very, very good experienced golden nuggets, I would say, <laughs> on this podcast episode. Wow, thank you very much, Christian. And uh, well, I'm 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 out of questions. I I don't have anything else to ask you. I know there are there are many, but this then this podcast will never get over. Tell us to our viewers and listeners, like where can they reach you if they have to? And are you in the field helping people? I know you do, and but that's a social cause that you support everyone uh, in their journey. But are there any? You also run the Oreo. Uh, Orio uh, Club in uh, Ottawa, right? Ontario Real Estate Investors Club. So people, you can go there anytime and you can meet Christian, a uh, very sweet person. He's very nice to talk to. And and, and you're, yes, oh, if they have to reach you, like they can reach you directly at socials, which we'll be posting with the podcast or? Yeah, so uh, I'll just put a, thank you for mentioning the Ottawa Real Estate Investors Organization. I'll just give a, a quick 15 second on that. It's a not-for-profit club for investors. Oh, yes. Uh, all of the, uh, you know, the executive slash board members are all volunteers. We don't make any money on this at all. It's really about helping each other out. Uh, the club is uh, usually in attendance. We have about 140 people typically in attendance uh, and our membership is close to 400 uh, overall. And people even as far away as Florida and Southern Ontario are, are members of the group because we record things, uh, record presentations so people can see it after the fact on our website. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, one of uh, six or seven board members on, mm -hmm. on that. So uh, myself, Victor Minash, Andre Hudson, Victoria Clooney, uh, Van Shepard, Mark M. Yot, uh, Brad uh, as well. So there's there's quite a few of us that are, uh, you know, working to, to help improve that. Um, yeah, you can absolutely reach me. My my website is oliferous.ca and uh, I know Harshi will have uh, links within the, the podcast. Yes. So you can find me on my socials, but with my last name, I am very easy to find. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and sp Spillfogel, right? Spli yeah. Spillfogel, okay. Yeah, yeah. There's a S-Z-P-I-L-F-O-G-E-L. -E right yes. So, and uh, I also uh, volunteer um, as a board director of the Eastern Ontario Landlords Organization. I've participated in the CFAA uh, and uh, recently also participated uh, was, um, uh, before the Parliamentary Committee on Housing back about a month ago. Um, so this is all part of um, giving back and trying to help the industry move forward, making sure that both tenants and landlords and developers are all treated fairly and with respect. Yes. Um, so that's that's kind of what uh, you know excites me. You know, my my main business, of course, we focus on that. 
Uh, but, uh, you know, the social causes is kind of what gives me a lot of energy. Very good. Very good. So people head out to that Oreo website and Ottawa Real Estate Investors Group. Uh, and if you are in Ottawa or nearby, uh, definitely go. It's once a month that you uh, meet. Uh, Second Wednesday of every month, uh, yes. usually from about uh, seven onwards. It's okay. at Southern Ottawa. If you go to OREIO.org, so Oreo.org, uh, all the specifics are there. Yeah. Okay. All right, people. Uh, so there it is. We had Christian. Uh, I hope this episode and uh, the knowledge that uh, Christian was able to provide proves of very value because it has been a lot valuable assets for me because I took some gold nuggets uh, regarding the commercial assets from this episode. Anyways, and whenever I meet Christian, I, it's it's always great. And I always try to pick up his brain on something and it's it always turns good. So head out to Oreo and if you want to meet Christian, he'll meet you there every second Wednesday of the month. Uh, with that, we'd like to thank you for your time today, Christian. And thank you for your time, listeners and the viewers. We'll talk soon in the next episode. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Right. <laughs>